Welcome to Ancestors. I'm your host, Scott Wilkinson. Today, we'll explore census records, the population surveys conducted every 10 years in the United States. Depending on the questions asked, these records can provide key information about your ancestors, such as ages, addresses, family relations, and even their country of origin. Censuses are an absolutely wonderful record, absolutely essential, regardless of whether you've been into genealogy for 20 days or whether you've been researching your family for 20 years. Censuses are indispensable. They're the best people finder that we have. There are just so many of them. Darius Gray from Salt Lake City stumbled onto census records while just beginning his family history research, and he discovered a gold mine of information on his ancestors. A friend called and wanted to know if I wanted to go do some genealogy. And uh, I had never done any, and typically when invited to do something, it was a polite thank you, no. I saw it as um, the hobby of the old folks. Uh, you know, the, t the typical image of the genealogy um, person, um, um, retired 10 years ago, bored, nothing else to do, uh, you know, her husband dead, might as well go do genealogy. But for some reason, uh, I really, just wanted to go and I said yeah I'll go and uh, so we chatted and when I finished that conversation I picked up the phone and I called my mom over in Colorado because I got to thinking let's see dad was born on October 6th 1896 and I, but I want to verify that because I'm going to use him as my starting point and uh, I called mom and uh, she said uh, your dad was born on October 8th 1896 and I thought well mom's older she doesn't remember turns out she's right I was wrong um, but uh, we chatted a bit and uh, as I was asking these questions mom said well I've got something here that you might want and I said what's that and she said I've got a piece of paper that has the birth dates and death dates on your father's side of the family it has the birth dates of his uh, siblings his brothers and sisters and has the birth and death dates of his parents. And I said, Mom, where did that come from? And Mom said, I don't know. It just showed up here a couple of weeks ago. She said, it's in your dad's handwriting. And so I, I said, Mom, that is very important to me. I didn't want to take a chance that she'd lose it or forget it. And I asked her to get it into the mail right away in hopes that I would have that when I started looking into my family history and doing genealogy. And Mom sent it. And I had it, and that's where I began. I started looking at census records uh, to try and find my relatives. They happen to be one of the best records of individuals and families that exist in this country. Not only do they list the individuals, but they group them in families. Uh, they often tell you where they were born. They give their ages, give their relationships, oftentimes they give their occupations. Using census records is almost like finding a mini biography or mini family history just all of a sudden. Fortunately for us as genealogists, these records have been preserved. They go back to the original census in 1790 and come up every 10 years up until today. Theoretically, the census taker went door to door and theoretically talked personally to each individual, which is not reality. But going door to door, getting the names of each individual, the birth uh, years or the ages, the birthplaces, the occupation, how much property they had. Most of the censuses have been microfilmed and you can access them at the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. Or you can go to any of its satellite family history centers and order the census microfilm you need. Another great place to go for federal census records is right here at the National Archives. Here you'll find every census available from 1790 to 1920. There's a 72 year restriction on census records and so our most recent census is 1920. Our records are organized by census year and then by state or territory. And they're under, they're organized by the county. If you don't happen to have easy access to the National Archives or the Family History Library or the various branches, uh, Family History Centers or other places like that, then you can go to your local library and uh, you can ask them if they are able to enter library loan 
uh, from the National Archives, so the, the uh, microfilm of the census. When you go online looking for a census record, for the most part what you're going to find are volunteer projects and um, everyday people that are putting up portions of the census or portions of a census index. Sometimes you'll find genealogical societies that have done the same thing. Uh, maybe they will publish uh, the entire county for a certain census year. And you find this all across the internet kind of bits and pieces of the census. I don't think we have the complete census represented yet. You know, every year from 1790 through 1920 for every county and every state. I think we're getting there, and I think the volunteer efforts online are terrific. The people are very enthusiastic about wanting to contribute to this online community. While African Americans would think, well, gee, there aren't going to be records for us, you know, because of slavery, that's not the case. You use the same resources until you get far enough back to need something else. Certainly African Americans who come to do research here at the National Archives can start with the federal census just as anyone else would start with the census records. Uh, certainly they need to have already talked to older relatives, finding out where people were living, when they were living there, uh, what their relations were to one another. The earlier censuses from 1790 to 1840 just list the name of the head of the household. Doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, but they just give the name of the head of the household and then break the household down by age groups. In 1790, they were only interested in counting heads, so they would know how many votes or how many men were proper age to serve in the militia that could help defend. But starting in 1850, they list everyone in the household. They don't necessarily give the relationship, but you can see who's living in a household at a particular time. There are many similarities between the questions that were asked on the 1850 census as opposed to, say, the 1880 census. But there were also differences that are very important. For example, the 1850 census asked for place of birth of each individual. The 1880 census not only asked for place of birth, it asked for birthplace for that individual's mother and father. Alone of the censuses uh, that the United States has taken, the 1890 census is no longer available to the public uh, because of a fire that took place in the basement of the Department of Commerce in 1921. Uh, this fire did not entirely destroy the census, but the combination of the fire and the water from the hoses um, resulted in a document which was ultimately destroyed during the 1930s with congressional authorization. When you get to 1920, they ask for your name, um, occupation, if you're an alien, how long you've been in the United States or the year you arrived, whether you had applied for citizenship or become a citizen. And that's very important for immigrants that came in because we have uh, huge numbers of immigrants that came in around the turn of the century and after the turn of the century. And then you want to look for other records in terms of ship's passenger lists, in terms of immigration records. So finding those clues and those tips on the census records helps you go to another record. I don't know how long it was before I really had success. Uh, I can't remember now if it was uh, days or weeks, but I know I spent a lot of time down at the library. And I started seeing the fruits of that labor um, as you're digging through and you're finding a name of a family member. Um, the light started coming on, the interest started to develop. It was like a puzzle and finding the pieces. Well, you find out who was really related to whom. When I was a little kid, I could care less. It was a huge family, and everybody had been married two or three times. Everybody had ten children, and, you know, we were probably related to about half of New York City. And I could never sort the wheat from the chaff. Well, when you finally get through, go through the census, you figure out who belongs to whom. And that's been interesting, you know, try and track them through and, and reconstruct the cousins club sort of thing. While the census can be a good source of information, it is prone to errors. The information is no more dependable than the people hired to do the enumerating. An enumerator is simply a big word for a census taker. And uh, there was a good deal of variability uh, among enumerators. It depends upon who the enumerator was as to the quality of the census that you get. Some enumerators were very conscientious, others were not. People didn't always trust the census taker. So somebody might not be home. Also, the census takers uh, 
particularly in the early days, had to go way out into the country. And they, it might be a dark, rainy night, and they say, I'll get back to that tomorrow, and tomorrow, they quite honestly forget. The husband may be out plowing the back 40 when the census taker comes around, and so his wife gives the information. Does she remember what state her husband was born in? The chances are that, that the respondent is not going to answer them all wrong. They may get one or two wrong, uh, but the vast majority of the answers will be correct. In many areas, the enumerator was a good old Anglo-American who had the right political connections, but the population may have been French, not English. And the census taker is trying to communicate with them and to get the answers from them, and he doesn't always understand. You could figure out what he meant in many cases. If the family name was Abear, it's A-B-E-A-R. Um, it's trust Claire, a little bit more difficulty. But finally, about nine pages or so into the census, he wrote down the name of a head of household on the federal census as Joseph something or other. I found the household, and there was an elderly woman living with them, which I assume was probably her grandmother. But on reading the line across, under the column that said infirmities, it was written in big block letters, dead. So I said, well, this is interesting. So I went through the rest of the town, and there were three other people also listed as dead. So I went back to the vital records, and sure enough, she died between the date, official date of the census and the date that the census taker actually reached the house. If there's so many problems with census records, why do we say that they're so valuable? Basically because they're the best people finders that exist, because they're, they are so widely available, so many of them were taken to start with, because the most of the censuses that are open to the public are indexed. I don't mean to pick on census records when I say that any part of them could have erroneous information, because that's true of absolutely any record that we use. No one record is ever an absolute source. You need to collect lots of information and then from there tie it together. One of the things that people may not be aware of is a lot of the censuses are indexed. And our later censuses have a very interesting index called Soundex. And the Soundex is based on how the name sounds rather than how it's spelled. So when a person came up in your name, you said, my name was Grinelda Thudpucker. He didn't ask her how to spell it. He just wrote it how he heard it. The problem is, is trying to find that name, how that person may have spelled it all these years later. You take the first letter of the person's last name, and then you code the consonants using a, a numerical system. You don't include the vowels. If you take a name such as Schaefer, S-C-H-A-F-E-R, S-C-H-A-E-F-F-E-R, S-C-H-A-E-F-E-R, it would sound X the same. It would be S160, based on the rules of the sound X. So when you go to the sound X index, you look for the code. The first time I used SoundX, I thought, how strange to have to use a number code. But as I got into it, I found it was very easy and led me to be able to find families where the census taker had spelled the name wrong, uh, had heard the name wrong, but because of the SoundX, you, you change the number over, you find the family. And it's really easy. My kids do it. My kids can look up a record and find them. So you've obtained the correct uh, SoundX number. You've searched through the film, the SoundX film. You've been able to go to the uh, right place within the SoundX film because the names are arranged alphabetically by surname. Now, when you go to the census record, you need to keep in mind that the names will not be arranged alphabetically as they were in the SoundX. The names are arranged as they were enumerated by the census taker. It's also important to remember that the Soundex only covers back through the 1880 census. Before that, the censuses are indexed alphabetically in book form. You may be able to get these books at a historical society or at your local library. These indexes are also now becoming available online. I sat down and uh, had been looking for quite a while and with no success. 
And after all of this other work of going through the sound decks and decks and you know, trying to figure out how this process works, um, move ahead two steps, go to your right and back up twice, you know, here I am finally looking and I couldn't find it and I really got frustrated. And uh, I remember I pushed away from the microfilm reader and I had a prayer. And my prayer was, God, uh, you brought me here. You must have had a purpose. And I've been doing this, and I'm trying, and I haven't found a thing. And if you want me to stay here and to continue with this process, you're going to have to help. Otherwise, I'm out of here. And uh, finished the prayer and leaned back forward and grabbed the fast forward button on the microfilm reader and just zapped it forward and stopped. And where it stopped, I looked at the screen, and there was my relative. With that piece of the puzzle and feeling as though progress was being made, I became what I never thought or wanted to become, a genealogy junkie. I was looking at a census record, and there was the family. And um, I believe it was my great-grandfather, Tuck Cotton. I was looking for my grandmother or one of his children. And as I went down, the page ended, and I assumed that that was the end of it. And actually, I had more children from Tuck Cotton on the next page, on, on the top of the page. And I needed to go there, and, and I didn't know that. And it was because someone else was there and helping um, that I found that. They said, well, you've missed some of your relatives. They're over here. And uh, so found it that way. But uh, in your excitement, you, you, it's great to be excited, but you need to be able to settle down enough to look to the next page as well. And one of the things that I always do is I read everybody on the page and the page before and the page after. It's amazing how many family members are living close by. I've had people tell me, well, I found my ancestor on the 1850 census, I found them on the 1870 census, I found them on the 1880 census, I know exactly where they lived, and Azariah lives in that house today. No, I haven't used the 1860 census, but why do I need that one? Because they asked the same questions in 1860 that they asked in 50 and 70, more or less. They may ask the same questions, but they don't always get the same answers. In 1850, you may have had a fairly young couple with their small children. By 1870, could be this young couple with their children who are coming of age. But in 1860, you may have had the man's elderly mother who has moved in with them. And if you don't get that 1860 census, you miss her identification. This was a family I had found in the 1880 census. I thought I had a pretty clear picture of what the family looked like. My mother had known the family. We knew everything there was. But I thought, well, I'm going to look for them in 1900 anyway. I looked for them in the 1900 census, and there was an eight-year-old daughter that I knew absolutely nothing about. She must have died young. I never found another record for her. But I would not have known about this girl at all if I hadn't looked in that census record. Along with the census, there's another record that lists people by where they live. It's called a city directory. These city directories contain information that can add to what you find in census records. So after you have located a family in a census record, then it's a natural reflex to go to city directories and then follow that family backward or and or forward into time and gather all the other information of when their employment may have changed, when family members moved in or out of the home, when they may have changed residences, if they were renting their home or owning their home. City directory is something I wouldn't have thought about until someone pointed me in that direction. And it will tell you not only what they were doing and where they lived, Lo and behold, you look across the street, and there's your grandfather's brother. And just down the street is another of the relatives, because it's giving you a, a broader picture. It lists every adult over age 18 that's living in a, in a same household. So then you can put together a family with four, five, six people living at the same address. Fortunately, what will happen sometime is that uh, you might have an ancestor named Charlie Smith, and you go to the city director, and there might be two dozen Charles Smiths there. So in that case, you say, well, well, which one is my Charles Smith? 
that's where family records come into play. And if you have uh, an envelope or a postcard or a letter or uh, some other identifying information that lists their address, then that way you can differentiate your Charlie Smith from all the other dozen Charlie Smiths that are in that city directory. The city directories that are microfilm in Salt Lake City can be borrowed through a local family history center, but in addition they have many others that are only in book form that are only in Salt Lake City. It's an easy source, it's a fun source, uh, they're easy to get to, and it's a real adjunct to help to use your census research and, and other research. It doesn't give you uh, the sort of typical genealogical information about birth date and literacy and you know those sorts of things, but it gives you the people side. It gives you the neighborhood, the community side of what's going on. It's not just dates. It's not just people having been born or dying on different, you know, days. Uh, it's, it's not about that. It's about family. It's about stories. And to hear about people's lives and to be able to fill in the blanks and to make it come alive, that, that's what was really fun. It's like very few other records that exist, particularly on that mass scale, because of the fact that when uh, the census was taken, the census taker or the census enumerator, same person, went out and they tried to get every individual in the United States that was living at that particular time. And again, no other record exists like that, where every individual in the United States was all recorded on paper in little mini biography. With the information you find in census records and city directories, you will come to know who your ancestors were by learning how they lived. And that's what it's all about, discovering your family and connecting with your ancestors. It was interesting to jump back even past the 1800s by extrapolating out my great, great grandmother's age from a census record and uh, to find that Maria Gaines uh, was born in 1796. And, and, and that's phenomenal. And to see her still with her family years later, decades later, um, gave me a sense of the family unity. And uh, I don't have a marriage record for her. Uh, I don't know who Mr. Gray was, but I know that Maria Gaines became the mother of Louis Gray. Louis Gray was the father of James Louis Gray, and James Louis Gray was the father of Darius McKinley Gray. And Darius McKinley Gray, my father, as the father of Darius Aiden Gray. I have a history. We were here. We were slaves, but we were here, and we were contributing to the fabric of this country. 1796, just 20 years after 1776, we were here. And how long we had been here prior to that, I, I don't know yet. I hope to find out. Next time on Ancestors, we'll explore military records and we'll meet Susan Hanlon as she searched for a World War II soldier she never met, her own father. I knew from the time I was born that he had died. But it's through the research and it's through the contacts that I've had that I know that he, that he did live.